Total Screen proudly presents the Weekly Set Podcast with Tyson Gifford and William Rorick. Episode 203, recorded April 20th, 2019. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Set, the official podcast of the Total Screen. I am your host. My name is Tyson. And joining me today, as always, is my partner in crime here at the Total Screen, William Rowe. Hello. So today we are going to be talking about The Magicians, the season finale, No Better to Be Safe Than Sorry, and uh, Game of Thrones season eight premiere, Winterfell. So those are the two episodes we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about one huge show and one little indie you know, show that nobody really knows about in that order. Talking about, you know, the magicians being this huge finale and Game of Thrones just being this little thing that nobody really talks about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then before that, we're going to talk about, we got one news story we're going to go over. So let's kind of get started with that. And that's that uh, Google and Amazon have had this like bitter little petty feud going on for a while now. Um, it started with Amazon basically refusing to support Chrome cast for uh, um, uh, their Amazon Prime Video stuff. Well, it, it actually officially started, I think, because they weren't even putting Amazon Prime Video at all on, on Android devices or anything like that. Because, you know, they, they had their, like, Fire devices and there, there's this whole thing where like, you know, with Amazon, it's not just a subscription. It's also you can buy stuff through the app and they didn't want to do that through like the Play Store because just like with oh, Apple. because Google will take a cut. Yes, exactly. And it's, it's like a necessary thing because if Google like changed that so that they wouldn't have to, they would create all sorts of like lawsuit issues right. with other people saying, wait a minute, you know, but we, we have to pay this cut. And then Google would have to say, okay, but, then. So but, but, we but won't. The thing is like, we won't. We won't charge for, you know, purchases through an app. We'll only charge if you pay for the app. Then every company that makes but, an app that charges will make the app free with a, with a mandatory in-app purchase. But the thing of it is, like, <laughs> Apple does the same thing, and that doesn't prevent Amazon from putting their apps on Apple. They it just did make, for a while. They, they just make you go to their websites to... To, yeah, to do actually any do shopping. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to do any like buying of content. Yeah. Which is, which is perfectly fine. I don't see the problem with it. Like I use, uh, I use Kindle for my iPad. And when I want to buy a Kindle book, I just go on Amazon.com and I buy, I buy the books I want to buy and that's it. Like it's not a big deal to, not be able to buy directly through the Kindle, so it would be nice, but it's not a huge deal. You could even do it on a tablet or a phone just using the web browser. Right. <laughs> so it's not even like, you know, you don't even like need a separate device. You know, you could still even do it on the same device. But yeah, it's not that big of an issue. Amazon was being kind of petty about it. Like, why should we have to give a cut to these companies? Which is ironic when you consider it's Amazon. <laughs> right. Like, that's their entire business is taking you, a cut you know, on, you know, on like if, uh, purchases. If, if somebody wants to put an app on the Fire OS that Amazon has, like Amazon wouldn't take a cut, you know? <laughs> like, give me a yeah, I, it's it's kind of like, ridiculous. It, yeah. It'd be like Starbucks complaining that some company was opening a shop on every corner. Right. <laughs> it's like, wait, that's what you do. You know, like, how can you that's, that's hypocritical, but a a Amazon was getting real petty about it. They were trying to hold their ground on it, but as their streaming service started kind of growing and becoming more of an actual, like, business prerogative for the company, and not just like this little side thing. We're like, oh, we have a few things on here, but nothing really worth paying that much attention to. As they started making these big deals, like what, half a billion dollars to license like a Lord of the Rings series. So they, when, when they start doing shit like that, it's like, okay, you, you need to give, give up this petty nonsense. This is like, get past it because you're, right. you're just going to end up screwing people, yourself at this point. If, if people on Amazon devices, on Apple TV can't can't watch Amazon Prime can't watch Lord of the Rings you're not getting the those ratings you're not getting Game of Thrones ratings or anything yeah. close to that and it's like at that, at that point, that's when you know the pettiness kind of needs to come to an end. Well, what happened after just kind of the general apps not showing up is they said, okay, fine, here's an app. Now you can watch these shows on your, your Android device or your iOS device or something like that. But then they just ignored the Chromecast protocol, which is like, it, it's just like this really short line of code that anybody can put in their app. And basically every video app supports casting. Right. On, on both iOS and Android. It's, it's not an issue. You know, it's not something that's 
hard or tricky. Like people are just doing it left and right. It's, it's, there's the only holdout is really, was really Amazon. They're the, like the only single, and you'd find like the most obscure video streaming things and they all supported it. It, it just <laughs> wasn't an issue. But Amazon was holding out basically saying like, Oh, we're not going to do this because we have a fire TV stick and we want you to buy the fire TV stick instead of the Chromecast. And so it's like, okay, wait a minute here. This is starting to get into, I mean, their video service isn't a monopoly in the way that their shopping services, like their, their actual like marketplaces, but that's like a monopolistic tactic to like leverage one business to force another saying like, if you want to watch this stuff, you have to buy this thing you know like we're not going to support our competition while at the same time saying oh you, you can watch it on tablets and stuff but if you want the true experience you can only watch it our way that's right. that's that's a monopolistic tactic except that they didn't have a monopoly in that particular field like they're not they're kind of a bit player compared to like netflix you know when it comes to streaming video uh so they're, they're not like in a position where where they're creating like a threat with that but it's it's still anti-consumer which is a which is problematic for a company to be um and so it just got worse from there because then Amazon was like, okay, we're pulling, not only are we pulling Chromecast from our store, so you can no longer buy, and this is, I think, still the case right now. Like you cannot buy a Chromecast on Amazon and you could before, but you can't now. And not only that, but then they took all of the TVs that supported casting and yanked those too. So like Vizio had kind of like Chromecast built in to their right. TVs and all those TVs got yanked from Amazon. Like they stopped selling them. That is is monopolistic um, material right there. That that is full on anti consumer antitrust behavior. Right. It's like that. That's the kind of stuff that should be investigated. But it wasn't. Like that. That's like straight up bullshit. What they were doing there. But they were trying to do it to leverage their position, hoping that they could get, you know, Google to back down or something. So Google dealt with this for a while. And then they said, you know what? We can be petty bitches too. So they went and they pulled the YouTube apps and made YouTube not work on any of like the Fire products. So you have a Fire TV. Well, you can't watch YouTube on it. You have a Fire tablet. Can't watch YouTube on it. You have a, one of those like Amazon Echo, like, you know, with the screen on it that they have that you can have like in your bedroom or whatever and do video calls on can't watch YouTube on it. So they so they pulled all of that too. And unlike Amazon, who's like streaming video stuff was kind of like this smaller market, YouTube is kind of a big deal. So this actually started hurting Amazon because Amazon was making these devices at the same time as competitors were making devices. And all the competitor devices all played YouTube and Amazon didn't. So it was like, okay, something's going to happen. I didn't think it was going to happen for the longest time. I've been, I've, I've mentioned on the podcast before, I'm a big Chromecast supporter. I really like the way Chromecast works. I like the kind of ideology behind it, the way casting works as opposed to just something like a Roku or a Fire TV. And it's always been like a sticking point for me that, oh, well, I can't watch Amazon Prime. And it's always been, it, it's to the point where we've talked about on the show where like, we'll talk about like, oh, this show's going to Amazon. It sounds good, but I can't watch it because I, I don't have like a, I don't want to sit, sit in front of my computer and watch it, you know? Right. So if I want to watch it, like how I watch stuff, which is sitting on my couch, relaxing and watching it on my big TV, I, I had no way reliably to do that with anything on Amazon Prime. Finally, about a couple months ago, I, and I, mentioned this on the podcast as well i bought a roku i bought a roku and hooked it up into the tv as well as the chromecast just for amazon stuff because i'm like okay there's a lot of like big stuff coming to amazon in the next couple years like it's i need some way to watch it and when i got it my the first joke i made was well now it's going to come to chromecast well, a couple weeks later, <laughs> a month later, something like that, guess what's on Chromecast now? <laughs> Amazon Prime will be coming to Chromecast. They haven't announced exactly when, but uh, it was a group announcement with Google and Amazon. YouTube is coming back to all those Fire devices, and uh, Prime is coming to Chromecast and Android TV. Is Google Play Store coming to Fire devices? I doubt it. <laughs> that, Amazon doesn't want that. That's, yeah, that that'll be a sticking point between yeah. the two. Yeah, I know. I, I just threw that in there like a little <laughs> joke because oh Google and Amazon are they're not they're not making up that hard. <laughs> <laughs> but they're stopping the just straight up petty bullshit stuff, you know, like that's right. that's coming to an end. Right. Finally, it took these, you know, billionaire companies this long, like years. <laughs> 
<laughs> to get over their fucking own egos and, and and do make practices that are not anti-consumer. So this is a win for consumers is what it is. Right. It means now it doesn't matter if you have fire devices or if you have a Chromecast, you're going to have access to more stuff. I actually, I actually do have a Kindle Fire I bought like uh, three years ago now. <laughs> and, so now you'll be able to watch YouTube on it. Yes, finally. <laughs> I'm going to dig that thing out of storage and watch YouTube so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm going to be able to use my uh, Chromecast to watch Prime now that I've bought a Roku TV that allows me to watch Prime. Nice. So. I already found an, another way around it, and now it's coming. Of course it is, because that's what happens, right? Anytime you finally go, okay, fine, I'll just buy this thing so I can do it, then the thing you've been waiting for gets it. It yeah. happened, I, I remember, um, what was it? I, I I I had, I was waiting for, I think it was on the Wii U, I was like waiting for Crunchyroll to come to the Wii U. And I was like petitioning on the thing, I'm like, come on, bring it to the Wii U. And I kept like, you know, going for it, and then I got a Chromecast, and very quickly they had a Chromecast app up for Crunchyroll. And then it was like, okay, finally got it and within like a month of that they announced like the wii u channel for it it's like well i don't need it anymore (laughs) i needed it for all these months and i finally found a different solution and now you're bringing it to me thanks thanks a lot but uh yeah so that's our our kind of one news story the the bitter pettiness between amazon and google is dwindling down a little bit so you'll have uh, more options on where to watch the things you want to watch which is good for consumers now let's move on to our first show discussion, which is The Magicians, Season 4, Episode 13. This is the season finale of The Magicians. No better to be safe than sorry is the name of the episode. So we're going to be talking about this, and we're going to be talking about Game of Thrones. And I'll just say, like, right up front, I like this episode more than I like the Game of Thrones for me. Same. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird to say. Yeah, I mean, and, and this episode actually made me uh, tear up a bit at the end, too. This, so. this one's really good. This was a r- really good great season finale it, it it does have some of that rushed quality where it seems yeah. like where, where which we which we saw at the beginning of the season two where they were just like running through plot threads uh wrapping them up a little quicker but it's but, funny because that's like what the, you, you point you find out what the priorities are in the magicians which is that yeah. you're so like oh, okay this is the story that's going forward and then when it comes to tying up the story they're just like blah blah just finish it you know yeah yeah, yeah. now let's deal with the consequences for the characters right focus on that and 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 that's where you can tell where the priorities are on the magicians that they don't really give a shit about the actual mystery or the actual story arc of the season it's all just about how that affects the characters right yeah in the yeah. end so like you're building up all this time to like oh, okay here's the big conclusion and then it's like a nothing bur- burger you know? <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's like really nothing but that's but at that point it doesn't matter because you're so wrapped up in the character story and what ends up happening to the characters because of this story that that's that that ends up becoming all you think about with the episode so yeah if you really did analyze it as far as how the seasonal plot like actually concluded it yeah it isn't they, necessarily a great ending for that yeah like the whole plot about everett trying to become a god you know that's just kind of that's just wrapped up real quick yeah uh, <laughs> well i mean it, we we ended the last episode and this is how we can jump right in is last week's episode ended with you know not Elliot's sister about to kill Dean Fogg after rampaging in the library and then you hear Quentin like hey demon lady whatever yeah you know Quentin come out Al- here Quentin and Alice uh, juiced up from, yeah. from the magic water you know confront her yeah and so you're like ooh okay so we're leading to a big epic thing that whole scene ends in like a minute <laughs> yeah it, 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 yeah it's I mean, it, it's not an epic fight it's it's basically like Alice like throws you know shoots magic Julia throws Alice and Quentin, and then Penny Penny pops up behind her, puts the axe on her back, you know, yeah. and and then they seal her in the jar with the uh, sealing spell. That's it. It's <laughs> like literally, yeah. like you're like minutes into the premiere, and the and the kind of like big scary villain that they've been alluding to has already been kind of taken care of. Yeah, so like half <laughs> of the threat is already taken care of. So yeah, because when you go into this episode, there's there's the threats of now now two monsters, one one even. Like like worse than the other and Everett, you know, trying to become a God, you know, we, we saw at the end of last episode, 
of Everett taking taking uh the water, the magic water, you know, that he's he, he uses he uses to juice himself up to god levels. Yeah. And, so that, that I mean that's what happened. So, you know, Quentin and Alice juice themselves up to take on not Elliot's sister. They finish her off like really quickly, kind of get her contained, so, go back yeah. to the well to get filled up again, and, and it's gone. The reservoir is gone. So like I said, so when we start this episode, there's three major threats, you know, and they gotta, and they, and of course it makes sense because it's the, it's the finale. So you're thinking they either gotta wrap everything up within the hour or something's going to continue over to next season. Mm -hmm. But they don't, they don't do that. They, it's, it's contained to the season because yeah, because they take care of the monsters and they kill Everett and there, there is no lingering threat for the season continuing into the next season. As far as I can tell. Yeah, they, they hint at like a few issues, but we don't really know what caused them or anything um, at the very end. But we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, Everett drained the reservoir, so they go back. They, they don't have a way to do that now. Now they have not only its sister contained in this device, but now it's they not going to hold her for long. They, they got to take care of not Elliot, so they need to use the spell again, but without getting juiced up. Yeah, and it's not just that, but they have to have a way of containing them in these things. That's true. Long enough, you, and to try to figure out where to put these things. To, to that's true, because that, that spell isn't like a permanent spell. It's going to wear off, and they're going to be able to escape. Yeah. So, yeah. so they now they have to work out kind of a new solution. They kind of come to that pretty quickly too, because yeah, because Julia reveals that. Because when Julia was possessed, not Julia took the scroll from the library and revealed her plan to not Elliot to go to the old gods domain and kill them. Mm -hmm. And basically what she wanted to do is kill the old gods and nuke, nuke everybody on earth out of existence. Just as an uh, added uh, benefit. <laughs> yeah. N not, yeah. Not because uh, it's, it's like some major plan. It's just because she gives negative two shits about life. Yeah. And, and, and she, and she's basically doing it to amuse herself. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so Julia reveals that she learned this and she also said the benefit of being back in her body that was possessed is that means Julia has the scroll. Yeah, because it was in not Julia's pocket. And now that it's Julia's pocket again, well, so yes. she has whatever was in it. Yes. I should, I should say this is, this scene comes after though because, because when Penny frees the, the spirit from Julia's body, he has to put an axe on her back and this leaves Julia in a state of constant pain where her wound is healing and unhealing because of her god status. Yes, and her, her, it, her not god status. Or, <laughs> I, or her I, halfway I, to god status. I guess, yeah. <laughs> because because of her status and because of the magics involved with the axe, they're conflicting and they're causing the wound to heal and reopen constantly. So Penny goes and gets a, a, a Max Hedrum yes, to help. Yes, the binder. <laughs> it's the binder to help out with the situation. And the binder's like, okay, well, I can push Julia in, in either direction. I can push her back and to being a mortal without magic. Like, uh, the binder's like old timey sexist too. Yeah. So <laughs> but he's like, I, I can, I can put her back to being, you know, a human without magic even, or I could bring her, restore her back to being a god. Well, yeah, because that's the thing. Because to stop this, Ju because, because Julia is in a halfway state, that's the reason this is happening. So you can fix fix the problem by transitioning Julia to either state. You know, like if she's human, then the wound will heal and stay healed. And if she's a goddess, the same thing will happen. It just won't happen in this weird in-between state that she's currently in. Yes. So, uh, yeah, uh, um, <laughs> but Penny's Penny, like, like, that's not my decision to make, dude. And, and he's like, well, ask Julia. And, and Julia's like, out of it. So she's not talking. Penny has to make a decision and he makes one that, you know, pisses Julia off a little bit, but she still understands later, which I, is, I, I think she'd be pissed off either way because she's, she's not, because it's not her choice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She, she's, she's pissed that like, she says she's pissed off that she's human, but I don't think it's that so much that is that she didn't get to choose for herself to be human. Yes. Which could end up playing into a problem in the next season, because if you remember the one goddess that was helping Julia around said that the whole point was that she had to make a choice. That's true. Yeah, that's and right. And she that didn't. The point. And she did. Yeah. So that could be kind of like one of the things that causes whatever problem we're going to be facing in the next season. Uh, could stem from that. But anyways, she's 
she's human now without any magic. She's kind of lamenting that a bit, but she's recovering. You know, she, she's angry at Penny at first. Penny kind of like is able to kind of talk it down and say, Hey, yeah, I made a selfish choice, but I didn't really have much in the way of options. Like something had to happen and you were out of it. So it just, there's nothing I could do, you know? And so she, she accepts that they're kind of moving on with it. We see like kind of just relationships in general kind of moving on and entering into good places with her and, and, and Penny 23, but also it, it's looking like Alice and Quentin are kind of back together now. Yeah. They've repaired, they've repaired their relationship. Yes. And, and now they've, they're kind of figuring out like a new plan, which is, you know, uh, well, they're kind of co- like cashing back and forth ideas on a plan, but before they can really come up with anything concrete, not Elliot shows up. Oh yeah. He's he, like, he, where's my sister? Where's the key? He shows up pissed and he's looking for the scroll that his sister had so he can go to the old god's domain, you know. Yes. And uh, very quickly, Quentin and Josh, who are like right in the path of him, end up activating the scroll and, and getting sucked into that. Yeah, because, because, because Josh, Josh very stupidly just pulls out the scroll and unravels it. Like, right and there. Josh has some power going on. Oh, Josh yeah. Josh because... is juiced up because he was turned into a fish for touching that water. And like, as a fish, he was sw- swimming in that reservoir water. Yeah. So, Josh... so even, even the fish bowl he was in, the, the water in that was probably reservoir water. Uh, so, so yeah. he was swimming in that magic this whole time. So he's kind of juiced up. Yeah, but he, yeah, well, he God, uses up all of his juice opening up that portal. Yeah, by accident. By total yeah. accident. And but yeah. ended up kind of saving them. And then uh I think Dean, Dean Fogg, Fogg kind of warps yeah, yeah, Elliot Dean away Fogg. with something. Yeah, and confuses him in the process too. So he warps yeah. him away and he leaves him confused. But Dean Fogg warns him that, you know, it won't last long and that, you know, he'll he'll snap out of his confusion and come back. It's basically the same thing he had on his suit that he used on that one librarian. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it kind of like sends them off somewhere and leaves them disoriented. Yes. Uh, but it, but it only lasts for a while. It's a, it's a diversion, but it's enough time because Quentin and Josh are now in this realm of the elder gods, which is like an office building because of course, why not? And they're being greeted as if they won like a contest for discovering their way there. But it's, you know, they didn't do it. They just kind of accidentally stumbled into there. So the guy's like, Oh, so you're not deserving of this praise and everything. Thing. And they're like, yeah, but we need to speak to an, to one of the old it's gods. So weird and, because it looks like it looks like uh, they stumbled into like the office of like a car dealership or something. Like, yeah, like, like the it's, dude looks like he runs a car dealership. <laughs> yeah. And their big like reward for arriving is like basically a balloon popping down in some confetti. Yeah, it's like he did it, and he's like, and he's talking about like uh, like he he thinks like they solved like some super advanced math physics shit or something that that like no no like very few humans could ever figure out and no human has ever you know figured and out no, and no no human ever has figured out and he's like oh finally somebody figured it out and they're like uh, no <laughs> <laughs> it's like and they want to speak to an old god and he's like he's like doing that for you that's that's like what did he say he said it's like a like an ant demanding a blow job from a it's, yeah <laughs> yeah something i can't remember but yeah <laughs> basically meaning it's like you know it, it's asking that of the old gods is like it, it's it's way below them to even and, and, consider and, and, and he's especially he's especially condescending to them because they didn't solve the mysteries he thought so they weren't even like as smart as he thought they were initially so, he just thinks they're they're complete morons like yeah, so the whole time. Yeah. he just thinks they're complete morons you know instead of so he's like extra condescending than he would have been had they actually done what he thought they did he's like you speak <laughs> well you speak quantum binary right or something and yeah, they're like yeah, yeah. no and he's like god you guys are stupid <laughs> yeah, yeah he's like yeah they're like uh we we actually we get we got here by accident <laughs> So they end up, they end up finally able to kind of get, you know, like they're like, come on, at least talk to us for a bit so we can figure this out. We have this problem. And, and they're like, talking about the monster and he basically gives them a little bit of advice. Yeah. He throws them a bone. He doesn't let them talk to any old gods, but he throws them a bone. Yeah. yeah. He says, he says that the, that they cannot be destroyed. Yeah. The monsters, it's just impossible. Which, they makes, can't be. which makes sense because they had that one imprisoned in that castle with the, all this complicated shit, you know, like if they could have killed 
killed it, you you think they would have just done that instead? Yeah, it's really yeah. funny though because they're like, you know, like they, they can't be killed. They're like, why not? And they said, well, why is a nickel bigger than a dime? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's all Josh can think about. He's like, why is that? Yeah, this this dude does not give straight answers. He's just like all riddles. But he does tell them, he tells them about the seam. And like, and Quentin and Josh are like, the seam? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? It's like, think about it. Like, there, there is, there is a universe in between universes where everything, it, where everything is dead, nothing can live. And there is a seam, there is a hole in that universe that's leaking into our universe. That's the seam. And they're still confused. They have no idea. And he's like, come on, guy, you know, like, like the seam between, and then Quentin finally puts together the, the mirror universe yeah the, the seam yeah. is inside the mirror universe but the mirror yeah. universe is like the same size as our universe right so right. it's like well where is it in there and and, and you kind of they, they kind of have a, a clue i guess an idea of where to start there well, Al- alice mentions that when she was niflin mm-hmm. she there was she discovered a door in the mirror universe that even she didn't want to go into you know that that was that was scary to even her as a niflin mm-hmm. which which if you remember alice says the Niflin, like nothing, nothing scared her or rattled her. So for something to be scary to a Niflin, like that's serious shit. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So now they, they have to come up with a new plan. Katie ends up devising the idea that, you know, they don't have anybody who's juiced up with enough power. But uh, to contain, mainly just to contain these. Um, but, but Katie being being involved with the hedge witches, basically de facto being their leader now, uh, you know, even though she doesn't want to be. And that's another thing we got to talk about is Katie, because Katie wants to die and join Penny in the underworld, her Penny mm-hmm. in the underworld. And that's where we left her last episode was her wanting to die. And this episode, we see her talking to to her, uh, I guess, her subordinate, the hedge witch guy. Which can't remember. He says he says that. die. He says die when not everybody needs you to live. Yeah, yeah. He basically tells her, you know, like she 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 is the leader of the hedge witches now. The hedge witches need her. You know, they need her, so she cannot die. She has an obligation to. She has an obligation to a lot of people to do right by them. She can't mm-hmm. just die and for selfish reasons. Mm-hmm. And so, and so he convinces her to, to, to get the cure that Zelda's getting and live. Yes. Katie ends up figuring out the plan, the, the, a way to, to build up a large amount of magic. And that is to find well, every, like every pipe of magic that's, that's, that has any leakage and position magicians there, hedge witches mostly. And that's, and, yeah, and that's, make a massive cooperative spell. And that's why I was going because, yeah, because Katie is involved with the hedge witches, what the hedge witches do, because since head witches aren't legit, especially in in the new world order where the library was controlling the rationing magic, head witches not being magicians were not entitled to magic, and so they've been squeaking by with whatever magic they can get, and they've learned to pool their resources together and just can't you know and and cast and amplify spells by casting them together in numbers, and that's a mm-hmm. trick that Katie learned being involved with them. So. So Katie figures us out. It's like, well, you know, just do what the hedge witches have been doing. If we if we can get enough people to cast the spell at the same time, we can, in effect, have the same amount of juices as one person who's juiced up. Yeah. So they they figure this out that this is a way that they can have enough magic to contain not Elliot and not Elliot's sister. Which we should say, by the way, they stop not Elliot. <laughs> oh well. They, oh, uh, oh yeah, that's right. Because after they after after Quentin and Josh go into the portal to the old gods, not Elliot is in is in the woods somewhere wherever Dean Fog transport him disoriented, and that's where Margot Margot confronts him and Penny and Penny again surprises him and Margot stabs or gets him in the gut with the axe. Yes. So they're able to get out. It was actually kind of a cool scene because as he's confused and laying in this forest, he's like remarking on the difference between him and his sister and that he appreciates yeah, he, like he, all the, he, the life on this earth. And he, he, he's saying like there's beauty in this world. You yes. Know? And he, he's remarking about like beauty and even like the silence. He's, he's actually, it's funny because like, uh, because it seems like the more that, he, more time he spends in this world, the more he's becoming sympathetic to it. Yes. 
But that's resolved real quickly anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Next to the gut. And, yeah. and, uh, yeah. So now they, they, they're bringing back Penny to get him healed up. And also now they, they have these two vessels and they need to get rid of them. Right. And so Quentin and Alice decide instead of like splitting up and deciding which one is going to sacrifice for the other one, that they work better when they're together. Yeah. So they decide to do it together. Penny goes with them, you know, so Penny can teleport them out of there. If they, they find the scene like almost immediately. Yeah, well, because Alice Alice figured out where it was. It was behind that door she was afraid to go through as an iflet. Yep. She, she deduced where the scene was or where the scene would most likely be. And, uh, so, and, and it's funny too, because when they get to that door and Alice makes it clear, like that place is dangerous because, you know, if, if you, if you go in there, if you use magic, you're dead. That's like the whole mirror world. She had talked about that before that like, oh, okay. if you use magic in the mirror world, it goes catastrophically wrong. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. But yeah, but so, so, so it's funny because when they get to the door, Alice gets, gets to the door first, but then she hesitates. She doesn't want to open it. And Penny, and, and I should mention this too, because because there's a scene with with Penny and Julia and Penny Penny is smiling and he's like all zen and Julia is kind of like why are you so calm you know like what the hell and he's like he's like because because you know if if we die that's dying isn't the worst thing that could happen you know yeah there's yeah. much worse things that can happen to you than yeah. dying so so Penny Penny is kind of zen so while Alice is super nervous going through this door Penny just opens it and walks in mm-hmm. you know without hesitation and so now they, they they find this mirror and it's got the seam in it and uh yeah so they're gonna throw these uh urn like objects that contain not Elliot and not Julia in them the monsters and and so they they throw the first one in presumably being not Julia I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> uh and then they're about to send the other one in but Everett slips into the room you actually see him slip in before they throw yeah. the first one in and, and Everett, uh, Everett basically he wants the monster to dissect its power, I guess. So he can become a god. He, he wants oh, to take he, the he power. To, like, he take, yeah, he wants to complete his transformation into godhood. And so basically, basically, he, he, he leaves it a choice. Like, he, he's like, he, he promises them, like, oh, you know, he's going to be a benevolent god. He, he He's not going to repeat the mistakes of the other librarians who turn themselves into gods. No, he's not going to be an asshole. You know, like, just take my word for it. You know, I'll be great. You and know? he can't, he can't just like overpower him because if he uses magic yeah if he uses magic they're they're dead but he he's he basically he basically like gives them the ultimatum that like basically he's like yeah go ahead and do it and then and then quentin decides to ignore his threats and just do it anyway but then he shatters the mirror Mm -hmm. that that contains the seam i guess and so he cuts off their access to the seam and and yeah so now so now they're in this standoff and he's like well your only real way forward the magic on this on not Elliot's you know urn or whatever is going to wear out and when that yeah. happens the monster you're going to have to deal with him yeah. and in the meantime like I'm the lesser of two evils here I'm telling you I'll be benevolent I've studied for this I've worked towards this things will be okay I'm oh, not going to hold any of monster. this against you I actually kind of admire what you've been able to do let's just just give it to me you know and Quentin doesn't want to do it and he makes eye contact with Penny 23 and kind of like lets him know to get Alice out of there. Quentin, finally, Quentin, finally just saying it. Yeah, finally just saying it. Well, Quint, Quentin decides he's going to make the ultimate sacrifice. He's going to do it. You know, he, he is he is prepared now to make the ultimate sacrifice. And he's going to do his specialty, which is what we found out earlier in the season from Mayakovsky. He says minor mending. Yes. He, he says, I'm good at minor mendings. And then he, fix, he uses magic to fix the mirror and, and regain access to the seam. As like the mirror's being fixed, he's like throwing the urn into it because you can see everything kind of happening at once. Everything, like the mirror's everything. being fixed. He's yeah. throwing the urn at the mirror to go back into the seam and you can see the magic starting to bounce around the room and get like, yeah, <laughs> you point, know, you can see it and destroy them all. At this point, everything switches to slow-mo and it's a real dramatic moment because you do see the magic. Quentin, Quentin throws the urn into the seam. Uh, we see Everett get consumed by the magic and destroyed. You know, Penny Penny is dragging Alice out of there. 
and Quentin ultimately is also consumed by the magic and killed. It, I, I don't know. I can't describe in words. Like it's a powerful scene. It, it, it really is. My description does not do it justice. It, you have to see it too. But it's the feels. It got punched me with the feels. Yeah, unfortunately, it was spoiled for me because uh, I wasn't able to watch it until the next night. And oh, uh, uh, that sucks. <laughs> and and like on my Google YouTube stream, it says you know uh, Quentin dying in the finale and why the actor is not returning. You know, like popped up. That was like the title. Of the story it was like okay you know they've been uh they've been uh telegraphing it throughout the season though there was you know obviously there was when alice read quentin's book and she read that he was gonna die mm-hmm. a premature death you know it sure it might have been like different but it still happened you know yes. like, like the ending of alice might have been able to change the ending of his book slightly but it not totally not the total meaning of the ending yes so yeah so so quentin's dead uh yeah Alice, you know, we see Alice and, and uh, Penny 23, like, on the other side of the mirror world after getting out and, like, just Alice waters is, leaking from Alice, the mirrors and Alice is... Alice is just destroyed. Yeah, she's just completely distraught. She's just screaming and crying. Yeah, because and, she, had just, she had just repaired her relationship with Quentin after, and, and you know, and, and the fact that she didn't... Her relationship with Quentin was sour this whole time. Was 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 killing her. You know, she she could not stand that Quentin didn't want to have anything to do with her. You know, she you could the entire season. You know, mm-hmm. you, you could see how distressed she was about that. And now that she's fine, her and Quentin have finally gotten back together and made amends. And then he dies right away. Like that's just ah oh god. Yeah, for Alice, that's just the worst. Yep. So we finally know who Penny ends up greeting in the afterlife. It's Quentin. And, so. and, and we get this great and oh my God, we get, and again, we get this great ending because it doesn't, he doesn't just die and then that's it. We get to, we, we get a scene where, because Penny's job in the underworld is secrets taken to the grave, secrets taken to the grave. And the secret that Quentin takes to the grave is is a secret to himself, really, that he doesn't he he doesn't realize how important he was or yeah. how he meant to everybody. You well, know? It's, it's also it's it's just that he's confused when he arrives at the afterworld is if he did something heroic or if he just finally found a way to kill himself because he'd been so oh, right, suicidal. Right. He was suicidal. So yeah, so he's asking himself, was what he did heroic or was it selfish? Yes. Yeah. And so yeah, uh, Penny says not Penny twenty three, but the regular Penny that's working this this position now says i guess i'm gonna have to take you for the grand package he's like no worries he's all expected it and and so he takes him to see his friends mourning him yeah and it's which is great, and which it's is made great. all the more powerful because katie cast her musical spell <laughs> which is great because it also redeems kind of a subpar musical episode right we, that we they had it. earlier this season with a, an amazing musical scene this is this is the best musical scene of the season right here yeah which is the you know it's then Morning, Quentin, around kind of like a bonfire, throwing you know, kind of me- mementos of him mementos, into the bonfire. Yeah, yeah things and, and it's they're singing um, "Take on Me." Yeah, they're singing "Take on Me," and 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 through that, Quentin gets the you know, Quentin gets to realize like like how 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 meaningful he was, the lives he touched. You know that you know the you know that he he made an impact on these people's lives mm-hmm. to, to the point where you know they're mourning him. And it's also especially sad because, oh, for Elliot especially, because Elliot had that realization when he was trapped in his own mind palace about, about his relationship with Quentin. Mm-hmm. And now, and now being he, like his biggest regret. Yeah, you know, being his biggest regret. And now he's finally back in control of his own body and Quentin's dead. He doesn't even get, he did, oh man, he, do, he doesn't get closure on that regret. Yeah. So you see everybody at first. You see, um, Alice, Julia, and Katie. And then, you see people kind of like arriving afterwards and and the last ones to arrive are Elliot and Margo. Yes. And and they're they're all kind of throwing in their their their, their keepsakes of Quentin into this bonfire as a way to say goodbye. It's really emotional. I was tearing up through the whole thing. Yeah, and then, you know, Quentin and Penny leave 
And uh, Quentin starts asking about, like, how is everybody going to be? Like, are, are, is everybody going to be okay? And this is where you get kind of, like, little snippets that are hinting at the next season, yeah, basically. Get, well, the, the biggest one is, is Margot and Elliot go back to Fillory, you know, because cause at this point, Josh and Ben are in Fillory. The back, mm. You know, Josh is back in Fillory with Ben and... And so we see Margot and Elliot go to Fillory and then they find out that uh, Ben isn't in charge anymore and Josh and Ben are gone and there's like some It's dark, been 300 years. It's been 300 years and there's this dark lord, this evil dark lord ruling from the castle, ruling Fillory. And yeah, somehow they ended up 300 years in the future. Yeah, so this is kind of like a big reveal for kind of like a plot line for the next season. Right, this is setting up a plot for next season because otherwise there wouldn't be any big setups for next season. Which is why I said, uh, this is, this is a, a, an unusual finale for the magicians because, because for the past three seasons, the magicians have always ended on a big cliffhanger that leads into the next season. Uh, the first season was the beast, the beast and running off with Julia, you know, uh, season two was magic getting turned off. And then season three was, of course, the monster, the monster getting released, yeah. the monster getting released and everybody losing their identities. You know. Yeah. So here you kind of instead, instead of having like a big kind of setup for the next season as the consequences of the actions, instead what you have is kind of a, uh, a, a, a focus more on the emotions of, of Quentin dying and right. what that means to everybody. And then you start, you get these kind of little hints at the next season through Quentin asking Penny what happens to everybody else. There's also, there's a scene not with Alice in it, but of, of the library and you know, they're, they're saying like, Oh, we're so happy that you're staying on Zelda to, to rebuild the library and to make it better. And she's like, Oh no, no, I, I, I can't lead the library. I, I'm not going to do that. And then she, she's like, I need, we need Alice. So that's kind of hinting towards what, you know, they're pursuing, the library is going to be pursuing Alice as their leader, uh, in the next season as well. And also Julia in, is now, you know, she's desperate and emotional. Uh, she's lost Quentin. She's lost magic. And Quentin's talking about how he's worried about her because she's so in love with magic now that like magic is such a part of her to, that he knows like for himself losing it is, is such a big deal. And he knows for her, it's going to be the same. That losing out. magic is such a, thing and then on top of it she doesn't have him another and, another uh loose yeah go ahead and penny kind of reveals you know well she ha she has lost magic but she's she's lost you too and where does magic come from it comes from pain right and right. so that cuts to a scene where we see julia and she's by the bonfire she's like now the last never, one there i don't think we, we we clarified this before to an extent but we did mention that julia is human now but we also didn't mention that julia also can't use magic because like oh i, I brought that up yeah okay yeah because she was made perfect in a yeah. sense yeah yeah, so she so. doesn't have magic, but she is like, she's the last one at the bonfire for Quentin, and she's got his deck of cards, is that he does his magic tricks with and stuff. And she goes to throw him in the fire, and it's a callback to Quentin's exam in the first episode. Yes. For break bills. When, when the, when Dean Fogg screams at him, do some real magic, and oh. he fumbles and drops the cards, but they all stay in the air. Yes. And that's basically what happens. She throws the cards into the fire, but they all, float in there and she's like Quentin are you doing this but then she starts to realize that it was her and that she's the one that's doing it she she got magic she got her magic back because uh Quentin's death brought her enough pain brought her pain yeah well, I think that covers everything then yeah well the one last thing I wanted to bring up is that you know I think when people see a big character death like Quentin uh they're they're gonna think like oh yeah but you know oh yeah it's a show if, with magic they'll bring him be, back if we're gonna be a quest to bring Quentin back like there was a quest to bring Penny back, you know, like, and, and we still see Penny is still a part of the show. Like, that version of Penny is mm -hmm. still a part of the show. And and the answer is no. Um, this comes from an interview with the showrunners, where they said this is permanent. Uh, the actor actually is leaving the show. He wants to actually be closer to his wife 
who his wife is the actress who stars in The Marvelous Miss Mizell. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's actually, that's actually his wife. And she films her show, I think in, uh, California, the opposite, opposite end of where, where he is right now. So he actually, he actually wants to be closer to her. And so he's leaving the show. Yeah. So he's not going to show up. He's not going to be in cameos. He's not going to show up as some other character from a different dimension. That's the same, like, like Penny 23. There, there's no around it. The, the character is gone. And, and we're, not they, see, we're not seeing him anymore. And they described this because they wanted to take a risk and they wanted to do something risky. Be, Quentin being one of the main characters, being the main character in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, you know, th- they want to take a risk and show that, you know, he's not safe. And I think they said the line like in, in real life, in real life, nobody's safe. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so they want to drive that home here to where like, you know, your main character status doesn't make you safe. The stakes are that high. Anything can happen, you know, and I think that's, that's great storytelling in my opinion, because yeah, yeah, because death has been so cheap and in media to a point where people die and uh, you're just look, counting down to when they're going to come back. And it's kind of like, I, I, I really like, I really like when it's meaningful when the, because then there's actually stakes. It, it's actually done for a reason and not done for shock factor, you know, committing to a consequence. Yeah. Committing to a consequence. Exactly. So I'm, while I'm sad about Quentin being gone, I'm also happy that it's sticking. They're committing to it because that makes the adventures more exciting because that makes it because that means when julia or penny or you know get into a deadly situation it could potentially be them and you know there's there's no fallback there's no safety net you know so so it makes it makes the rest of the story more exciting and you know i think and and i and i also agree that major characters should not be safe you know you should be willing to take those risks in your story because now it makes the story more interesting too because without quentin you know like how is how is the group dynamic going to change how are the characters going to be affected you know their personalities their interactions you know it kind of changes up the dynamic and and, and also like it might force people to step up it's kind of like in the episode uh, earlier in the season when when penny uh, not 23 the main penny was in the afterworld talking before he got his current job position he was talking, he was talking about character. one guy I and he was talking about how and having him read all these different characters books and and his point he was trying to make is that you know like you think Quentin's the main character but he's not the main character there's not a main character or anything like that and he's, and he's trying to have him learn that by going through that and that's just another way that they've kind of alluded to this hey, that's an, yeah that's earlier a, in the season yeah that was a direct allusion to this because in a way they were kind of preparing you beforehand for what they were going to do by by kind of bluntly driving home that message like you think Quentin's the main character, but other, there, there's a whole cast of other characters. They matter too. Their perspectives matter. Their stories matter. The show isn't over without Quentin. That was basically the whole thing. And I think also that I think also from a narrative standpoint and continuity standpoint, the point of that test was because Penny was going to get this job, and the first person he was going to have to deal with is Quentin. I, and we found out the the guy who Penny was talking to was actually testing him. I think the reason why why the tester like said you know Quentin was the main character he was actually preparing Penny for what he was going to be for what he was going to have to do which is lead Quentin into the afterlife yes and that's interesting because that was the episode <laughs> in which we saw Penny greeting somebody for the afterlife and we didn't know who it was right exactly so and that was all in that episode um that yeah was like a big kind of uh almost like a two-parter like that episode and this episode are almost like a two-parter that sums up the season in a way um, it's kind of interesting. Like it was an interesting way of telling the story because that was a great episode when it aired, and now it has even more meaning to the way this the season ended. Uh, but that's it for the magicians. We'll probably be talking about the magicians when it comes back for season five, which it's it's already been renewed for. Um, but that's gonna be a ways off. That's like gonna be another year at least. You know, who knows now? Like TV shows are coming back after two years now. So, and that segues us into our next show, which is Game of Thrones, the show that everybody waited two years for <laughs> this is going to be the season eight premiere season eight episode one winterfell everybody and... dies everybody's <laughs> dead the rest of the season is a white walker like victory dance <laughs> they're, they're they're doing that floss dance <laughs> yeah they're doing the Fortnite in unison <laughs> for five episodes <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
No. <laughs> Anyways, the episode starts. Uh, Daenerys and John are coming to Winterfell. They have their, their, the troops of the Unsullied, uh, the Dothraki, everybody kind of like going through Winter yeah, Town, which is the town for Winterfell. They're marching. Um, and, and instead of everybody being excited and happy, nobody looks happy to see them. Like it, people, people are gathered around and watching them, but it's, it's, it, it's like a parade, but like everybody watching the parade is sad or upset. Yeah. Yeah, there's even some like allusions to like racism. Yeah. In in, in like the way when they show uh, um Grey Worm and Masande and when they're going through they kind of have like a knowing glance to each other cuz people in north are kind of looking at them, you know, like you foreign invaders, you know, like it, with with like a prejudice or something and that they're kind of having to deal with. But there's it's what's interesting here is that this whole opening scene with this uh, them arriving at Winterfell is like a direct parallel to uh season 1 episode 1 of the whole, of the entire series when King Robert arrives in Winterfell. They're yeah. using the same music when, when the, it's marching through. We had like Arya running and jockeying for position to be able to see them arriving to, to watch the knights. And in this one, we see this kid doing the same thing and Arya actually moves aside because you see the kid go up and he can't, he can't get through to the front to watch anything. And then you see one person kind of step to the side and leave an opening for them. And then you see the kid run through it and you see that it was Arya that had stepped aside to let the kid through. And she's kind of watching him in that like, oh, to be young again kind of way, you know? And then the right. kid immediately goes up and starts climbing like Bran, referencing him as well when he was excited that King Robert was coming and he was climbing on the castle walls. And so, yeah, so we see everybody kind of arriving. The people are, look, the northerners look very distrustful. Um, Arya looks pretty Arya, excited to see John and everything, yeah, but she Arya's, can't. Arya's happy when she sees John, but then uh, the hound strides by and and Arya's like face face sours at the sight of the hound. A little bit, yeah. I mean, she also gets like a little bit of a, a smirk when she sees Gendry too again. Yeah, I th- but she I doesn't think, directly I, greet any of them. I, I think I think Arya has a crush on Gendry. Oh, I think they they kind of have a thing for each other that they're playing out through this. Yeah, I think they. Uh, yeah, I think they. They are. have like a little awkward moment together later on. Yeah, they do. <laughs> but after after this whole procession gets through, uh, Sansa's immediately like being passed aggressive and greeting Daenerys oh, yeah. to, uh, to being Sansa there. Sansa is definitely not down with Daenerys. It's like, it's an awkward, it's an awkward thing. Uh, when, when your sister doesn't approve of your girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's just not, not happy about it, making that plain on her face yeah. that she's not happy about it. Daenerys is trying to be very friendly. She's like, she's like, oh, the North is as beautiful as Jon said, as are you. And Sansa's like, yeah, whatever, bitch. And so, yeah, so I was like, get get the fuck away from me, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then Bran has the line that kind of sums up my feelings of almost the entire episode, which is, we don't have time for this. <laughs> yeah. Bran, He's like, get on with it, people. Bran and he, like, he breaks the news immediately in like the most kind of you know, undramatic way possible to Daenerys. Like, the Night King's already taken your dragon that died. He now controls it. They've destroyed the wall. And they're on their way here. We don't have time for this shit. <laughs> Well, Bran is no longer Bran. Bran is the three-eyed raven now. It's just funny, though, because it's like yeah. all these kind of things like, oh, when Daenerys sees her dragon again, it's going to be so dramatic. It's going to shock her. And, and it's yeah. like Bran just like spills the beans in like a second. Yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like, well, you know, yeah, the Night King has your dragon. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, Daenerys didn't know like he revived her dragon. Yeah. So you kind of you see the expression on her face kind of sour when he says that. But then at the same time, like she doesn't even have time to react to that because he just keeps unloading more information like <laughs> they've broken through Winterfell they're marching towards hearth, last hearth or you know like <laughs> Bran, Bran, Bran is just going to be an exposition dump he's, he's just going to be oh oh, we need an exposition dump let's go to the square and talk to Bran <laughs> I, did, I, I did a video earlier this week that you can find on our YouTube channel where I was basically complaining about um, in, in my opinion I think that some of the parallels they were making not just to the season one premiere but to the season one in general it's it seems almost like as if they're kind of playing around too much in the same way that they did in the first season when they knew they didn't have the budget for like a battle or something. Right. They would have like a meaningful conversation between characters and then it would cut away to after the battle and then 
it would have another meaningful conversation or something. And the way they would do that, and it was good writing and stuff, but like they were doing it because they didn't have the budget to show those battles. And yeah. and they haven't really done that in a while because, you know, after season one, the show became started getting so huge and it's growing progressively every season. Oh, and, and you know, and you know, like you got to think budget issues, you know, HBO gave, gave them like all the money they, they yeah. could ask for for this season. So you got to think if, if they're like, if, if, if they're, if they're being stingy with the budget on this first episode, that must mean that they did some really epic shit down there. They did some epic shit down the line. I don't think it's because they ran out of that. I think there was intentional parallels to season one. Oh, okay. I think think they were intentionally drawing parallels to season one. They're playing on the idea. So you think they were intentionally presenting this as low budget to draw that parallel? Not, well, not, I mean, because none of it's presented as low budget. The settings and everything are immaculate. Oh, yeah, the the sets are. There's there's lots of dragon CGI and stuff. Not really meaningful dragon CGI, but. Not really meaningful. But then there's like not not a lot of action happens. Exactly. It's like it's cutting away from battles. Like, I'll get to it later, but like the kind of the main point I bring up in the video is the is Theon rescuing his sister and how kind of anticlimactic it was. That, that just happens. Like, the, yeah, Theon doesn't even have to fight anybody. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get to that later. Well, and the, you don't, the, and you don't see like any White Walkers in this episode. Yeah, but I was just saying, like, with Bran saying that, basically, we don't have time for this. This is like this is like my credo for this entire episode. Like, we don't have time for this. What are you doing? Why are you why are you riding around on dragons, singing a whole new world? You know what's going yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, we don't have time for this shit, you know. Like, there's this shit happening here. You guys need to get ready. Yeah, yeah. They have, they have like a super fun. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it, it's, it's on like, this magic dragon ride. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Jon Snow is like so, so in love. He, he can't, he can't focus on the task at hand. Yeah. So ever, nobody's really keeping their eye on the ball. So like, the brain kind of sets that up right at the beginning, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, Arya wasn't there to greet Jon because she had gone down to watch as they arrived and kind of stayed hidden. She eventually yeah. meets up with John again, but the their, their reunion kind of isn't necessarily what you'd expect because there's a moment where, you know, he he's when he's talking to her, he's kind of like, oh, you know, Sansa, she thinks she's smarter than everybody you know, and, and Arya immediately jumps to Sansa's defense. Yeah. Which kind of like before, I think that was a big part of Arya and John's bond before, is that they were both kind of displaced within their family. Right. Like Arya was like this tomboy that was expected to be a lady and she didn't want to be a lady. And and John, and, and was, John the was the bastard. Yeah. yeah so, the bastard. so and they kind of, that was kind of like their bond. So like that seems to be kind of gone in a way because like there's still love there, but like that, that the, the meaning of that bond is kind of gone. Well, we saw like last, last season, uh, Arya had Arya and Sansa's relationship had strengthened because they, yes. you know, they, they, they worked together to take, to take out Littlefinger, you know, uh, they had, they had strengthened their bond. So Arya had grown closer and, and John is just shit talking Sansa because Sansa doesn't like his new girlfriend. Yes. Yeah. You know? And Arya's like, Sansa's the smartest person I know. She's t- trying to take care of the family. And John's like, I'm part of the family too. And she's like, don't you forget that when she hugs yeah. him. Yeah, basically, don't be, stop thinking with your dick. Don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> there was some cool stuff though with their reunion. Like, you know, uh, John pulling out his new sword and saying, you know, showing it to her. And she's like, Valerian Steel. And he's like, jealous. And she or pulled like, out Needle. <laughs> yeah, when, when she had Needle and, and, and he was like, like, uh, have you had to use it? And she's like, a few times. Or just even their first greeting of just like, how did you sneak up on uh, on me? And, and she's like, how did you survive a stab to the heart? And he's like, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a few kind of little cute moments in there and it ends with a hug and there's still, there's still love there, but it's like that the type of bond that it was before isn't, that's not what it is anymore. Now it's just familial love. It's not, it's not the same like right. outsiders bond that they had before. Right. Speaking of Arya, we'd mentioned Arya having kind of like a, a flirty moment with Gendry and having, you know, a little souring moment with the hound. Well, our, we, we see a scene where Gendry is working at the forge in Winterfell and he's making making weapons out of dragon glass and, and he's kind of bragging up his skills at making the axe for the hound to the hound and the hound's just like you know oh, don't don't talk yourself up like you know you need to be taken down a peg and so he's like you know who makes the weapons for the wildlings he's like the cripples and the cocksuckers which are you <laughs> <laughs> and gendry's just like okay that's rude i just made you an axe what right. the fuck man and Arya's like uh leave him alone and and uh the hound's kind of sh- a little shocked to see her and then they kind of 
it, it's they have like this weird kind of moment because he's like he's like you, well, he's you like, are he's like you left me for like, dead and she's yeah, like I robbed you. you first yeah I robbed you <laughs> yeah and he's like you're a cold little bitch aren't you and then it just but then right after that he says I guess that's why you survive so it's yeah. kind of like this disrespect right. that he's showing to her and so there's kind of like an uneasiness between them like it's not necessarily hate anymore like I don't think the hound's on her list anymore no and you know I it's don't, like I, I don't think I don't think the hound hated her even after what she did you know? No, no. They, I think that was pretty clear when last season, the moment between Brienne and him, when when they were talking about her, you know, right? That, like he does, he cares about her, you know. Yeah, he's, he, he still cares about her. He he called her out on being a cold little bitch. Here's but, the thing: that the Hound is one of those those hard men, those tough men who they have feelings, but they don't. He doesn't want to show them at all. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like Tell, telling her that that I guess that's why you survived is basically his way of saying I love you so much. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's the best you're going to get out of him. So. Yeah. <laughs> so after the hound takes off, Gendry and Arya have a little moment uh, where he's kind of stammering because she's like, you've gotten better at that, meaning the blacksmith. And he's like, oh, yeah, you too. I, I mean, you look good. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so it's this little kind of flirty moment. Arya gets a little smile on her face. They have they have a few little moments playing back at, into their early she interactions, wants, like in season a, two. She wants Gendry to make her a weapon out of dragon glass. Yeah, it's kind of like a strange thing because what's interesting is that she she has a sword that's going to be ineffective basically, except for maybe swatting people away or keeping people at a distance. Right. Um. But then she also has a Valerian dagger, which which will kill both she whites and go. white walkers. Right. So she already has Valerian steel, but it's a, kind of like a short range weapon. So the question is like, well, why does she need another weapon? Like, what's going on? It kind of hurt. And we know <laughs> it's not. We know it's not just something basic because she has like a whole blueprint designed up it's it's like a uh it's like a dragon glass dagger that like connects to a lance and can be disconnected from it or something so there's there's something going on in the design there she's got some kind of a plan some kind of an attack plan uh that makes use of this we just don't quite know what it is yet right um yeah. but it's interesting because like if you've seen like the first trailer for this season that was released began with her kind of like seemingly running away in a panic and after watching that trailer a few times I had come to the conclusion myself that it seemed out of character for Arya. It would seem if it would if it was to be something that was out of character for her, it seems strange that they would reveal that in the trailer, too. So I started thinking, well, what has Arya done before? Remember when she faced the waif? She got herself injured. And then she she I mean she really was injured, but she really acted it up, acted up her injury, acted up a mad dash to escape from the waif, the whole time giving the waif time to follow her and led her right into like a trap basically and i think that that's Arya's going to try the same kind of thing with with a white walker she's going to try to lead a white walker away from its group and you know play the play the scared little girl and and lead it into a position where she can ambush it and kill it and i think that this weapon might be crucial to that like it might be part of that plan right but right. but who knows what the weapon itself who is who knows we're gonna i guess we'll find out subsequent episodes uh but yeah there's that there's also we also get Cersei and with a uh, you know a moment with Cersei and the the leader of the Greyjoy army the the asshole Greyjoy <laughs> you're on Greyjoy uh, yeah, yeah, you're you're on Greyjoy yeah I have that down the notes a little bit but we can get to that now it's is basically that um yeah, so, uh, the, the Euron and the Greyjoy fleet arrive bringing, um, the Golden Company with them. Right. And, uh, as, as they're pulling into the harbor, Kyburn turns, tells her, turns, ah, finds Cersei and tells her, I have horrible news. The, the dead have breached the wall. And she's like, good. And kind of smiles and he just looks kind of horrified. Yeah. He, at that. So, so she, she, she's scheming something. We don't fully know what. She's all oh, making an alliance with this un, you know. Yeah, un, yeah. Un, undeal like person of evil who only wants to destroy all life. Yeah, if she, if she thinks if she thinks she's gonna try and make an alliance with Night King, ha! Huh? I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's exactly her plan. But I think, I, I think she's trying to figure out a way where she can, she can use these direct these White Walkers at her enemies before her. Yeah, which is just, I mean, just gonna mean a bigger armor or a bigger army at her doorstep. 
up. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> it's so. kind of a dumb plan, but she, I think she's kind of on like her last nut. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think so. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So, so she goes back, she greets the Golden Company, or we find out that a few of the Golden Company died on the trip. Basically, Euron just killed them. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, it, he it, talks like, about them cheating at cards, and then he says, or I cheated at cards. Somebody cheated at cards. Basically meaning, like, he just wanted to kill somebody. Yeah, and and then and then he just writes it off. He says, well, they weren't good fighters anyway, so no big loss. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, golden, the guy in the Golden Company is already kind of like, you tell not too happy to be there. But he's being polite, and he's like, it'll be a pleasure to fight with you on the battlefield. And Cersei's just disappointed that there's no elephants. Yeah. And she's like, she's like a little girl, she, like, at the, at the circus. It's like, where are the elephants? I was promised elephants. I was promised elephants. Euron the spends salt and, and Charlie and yeah. the Talker Factory. And then and then and then Euron spends the rest of his time begging to get into her pants. Or and like, she, you know. after turning him down, she then immediately relents. Yeah, because he won't stop fucking crying. You know, he won't stop fucking begging. So, <laughs> so she fucks him. They have their little moment of pillow talk afterwards, where he's trying to get her to compare him to both King yeah. Robert and Jamie. Yeah, she plays. Yeah. Along with King Robert, and it's like I, you know, again, he's so freaking insecure. He has to have her tell him that he's the best she ever had. You know, like Jesus, what a fuck boy. <laughs> she, won't, she won't relent on Jamie, but she relents on uh, uh, on Robert and kind of like says, makes some snide comments about Robert not knowing his way around a woman. Right. We already knew because we already knew Cersei. Cersei didn't really love Robert, and she and also we we know even though it's never explicitly stated, we know she. She got him killed on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the last thing that happened in King's Landing, since we'll just address it since it's all here, is that uh, um, she sent Kyburn um, for uh, Braun right as he's, you know, fucking some prostitutes. <laughs> There's a great way, moment where, like, by, right... By, by the way, for everybody who thought Game of Thrones was done with the nudity, well, they just proved you wrong. Yeah. Bronn's fucking, like, has, like, three prostitutes with him. He's, yeah. he's just basically inserted himself into one. And Kyburn's like, ahem, I have yeah. this with the queen. And he's yeah, like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, like, like the worst... Kyburn has, like, the worst timing in the world. Uh <laughs> yeah. and so, uh, uh, like, right after he breaks it up, like, the prostitutes are leaving, and one of them, like, then, walks by Kyburn and kind of flirts with him, and She's like, he's yeah, like, oh, I, poor, poor dear. She's she'll, the pox will take her in a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and yeah Bron's yeah. like, which one? <laughs> yeah, which one? And now Bron's worried. You know, like, yeah, that was a fight scene. But yeah, like Kyburn says, you know, they'll they'll give Bron like a shit ton of money if he kills Jamie and Tyrion. Yeah, and then not only that, but she, uh, Cersei wants them to be killed with the crossbow Tyrion used to kill their father. Yes, because you know, she because wants, she wants the dramatic irony. Yeah, she she wants a poetic death. Not just any death, but a poetic one. Yes. It's Cersei has a flair for the dramatic in, in her evil streak. Yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> So back back up north where the rest of the episode takes place. Uh, yeah, um, we have a, a few scenes with diff between different characters. That's, I mean, the majority of this episode is just scenes between different characters. Yeah, just, like, again, we're just catching up with... This episode is catching up with everybody before the real shit goes down. Uh, Tyrion and Sansa talk to each other. She's kind of uh, belittles his intelligence a little bit because he believes that um, yeah. Cersei's coming with the troops. Well, well San Sansa is right, though. Sansa is right because Tyrion is being a usually naive because because well well Tyrion also has a bit of information that Sansa doesn't know which is that she's pre you know Cersei is pregnant that's what that's Tyrion true. found out last season I don't think that's true do you think that's a lie I think that's a lie I okay. think she's she's used it too often as a manipulation that I think it's just bullshit we, we do see her rubbing her belly after she had sex with Euron you know? oh she says that every time she does it every time she wants to like try to manipulate somebody with that information <laughs> so you think she that's just a manipulation technique but yeah, yeah. But, but it's either that or she's just it's because she's insane but getting back to Tyrion from Tyrion's perspective this is what Tyrion believes to be true that she's yes. pregnant so from so I think that's also I think that information is also informing Tyrion's opinion on what Cersei is going to do or what her motivations are and, yeah and he just he wants to have peace between his sister yeah and he, he does he he wants to like and Tyrion basically says oh 
yeah, she'll come because you know, like at this time, you know, her her life is on the line too. She you know? she has something to live for. Yeah, something she has something to live for. And Sansa is like Sansa's like you know I used to think you were the smartest person I I ever knew, and that's not and and you know and she's like and I don't think that's true anymore. You know because yeah, yeah because Tyrion is being naive and Sansa is being realistic. Sansa is like I know Cersei. That's what you're talking about is not Cersei. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go for the, the, the strikes against Tyrion. He's made a few boneheaded decisions in the last couple seasons. Yes. Um, it's not just been like this one. It's been a few. But I don't think Sans is anyone to call anybody out on stupid decisions. True. She's not really <laughs> done anything smart. And even in this season, she's antagonizing an alliance that they need desperately. Yeah. yeah just which because, isn't smart either. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just because she doesn't like this woman. You know. That that's. Yeah. Really good she's she's it. doing stupid things herself. And, and, you she, know? And, and she doesn't have any reason to hate uh, Daenerys outside of the fact that she's a Targaryen and she's an outsider. And also... Yeah, and she's, and also in, instead of instead of working to try to like avoid a situation arising from like Northerners being upset about it, she's like egging them on. She's right. like holding Trump rallies. She's like, yeah, yeah. lock her up! Lock <laughs> her up! <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's seriously she's like she's not she's not really like so it's, it's like I, I can stand for the strikes against Tyrion's decisions because he is making some boneheaded choices but I can't stand for her to act like she's above it right because she's doing shit that's just as stupid if not more so like even in this episode you know <laughs> right but it is funny to see Tyrion put his faith in C- Cersei and then it, when you know just a, a moment before we, we saw Cersei get the news about the White Walker and realize she's completely off her fucking rocker yeah you know? so, so like Tyrion is expecting her to act sane she is not sane yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> they also had a kind of uh like a discussion about the last time they saw each other Tyrion's a little bit hurt about the way she left because when she left it really kind of screwed him over yeah um and, and put him through a very in a very tough spot and so he's he's a little bit bitter about that but I like the part where you know he's like we haven't seen you since Joffrey's wedding he's like a horrible affair and she's like it had its moments of course meaning Joffrey's yeah, death <laughs> Which was great, uh, yeah. but yeah. So, so they, they we had that uh, scene between Sansa and uh, Tyrion. Um, then we also have a, a scene where uh, basically John and Daenerys's advisors, meaning like Tyrion, um, uh, Varys, and uh, 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 the Onion Knight. Uh, oh, I, I love this. Uh... Are basically hinting at getting them married. Yes, they're they're like you know Daenerys doesn't have the support of the North. John does have the support of the North. How how do we give Daenerys support of the North? You know, like and and like hinting at that they need to marry these these people off. Yeah, they do. They of do course, do not do knowing they... that what we know, which is that they're uh, aunt yeah. and nephew. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little incestuous, but you know that's incest never bothered the Targaryens before. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the people discussing it is a Lannister. So <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, we have we have this nice conversation with Tyrion and uh, Varys, where Tyrion just makes jokes about Varys is being an Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, Varys is like, uh, you get so offended at dwarf jokes, but you just keep making eunuch jokes. Why is that? And he's like, Cause probably because I have balls and you don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as they're having this conversation, they're on the wall. Uh, yeah, Daenerys and John are are going to uh, see the dragons. This happens after there's kind of a moment where Sansa calls out Daenerys, basically saying, "We have we, we stocked up food for the North um, in Winterfell, like enough to kind of try to support the North for like a year." That wasn't taking into an account the Unsullied. That wasn't taking into account three full grown dragon or two full grown dragons. That wasn't taking into account Dothraki screamers. It's like, how are we supposed to feed everybody? She's going out. She's like, what do dragons even eat? And Daenerys says, whatever they want. Yeah, whatever they want. And after that, there's a moment when she talks to some Dothraki and um, they're like, uh, how many? And, and they're like, only like, you know, eight or ten goats or something. And then she turns, John's like, what's up? And she's like, oh, my dragons are hardly eating. <laughs> <laughs> my dragons are hardly eating. So this leads to the aforementioned scene where... A whole new world. <laughs> yeah. John and Daenerys fly around on dragons, you know, and basically, and then they end up at a waterfall and they kiss, and it's so romantic. And Drogon's just mad dogging John the whole time. Yes, yes. Like, that's my mom! My mom! Uh, <laughs> 
and then and then we get when then then we get to some major stuff because we get to jeez uh, <laughs> my mind is uh my mind is wandering here uh well Sam, I'd say the next Sam big Wall. thing is uh Daenerys Wall, yeah Daenerys and Jorah are going to visit Sam and they look all happy like they're all smiling and laughing at each other like ooh we're gonna surprise Sam and give him like a reward for saving your life this is gonna be great and they're all happy with themselves and they get there and yeah they're Daenerys, like Daenerys wants to give Sam a, a reward for saving Jorah from the grayscale. And she yeah. kind of coughs to alert him of her presence, and he kind of stumbles up. He's like, oh, oh, sorry, you know, typical Sam way. Yeah, he's he's Sam like way. being super polite and friendly, and they have like a little moment where he's like, uh, she's like, surely there's something I can give you. And he's, he says, uh, maybe a pardon? And she's like, for what crime? And he's like, he he's like, I stole yeah. some books <laughs> and, and and a sword. And she's like, from from my the, dad. you stole a sword from the Citadel? He's like, no, from my dad. But it's been in the family. It would have eventually been mine, but my father had other plans. It, it, it's funny because he's like, he's, he's asking for a pardon from his dad, and then she's just like, "Oh yeah, I killed him. It's cool. Yeah. He's he's dead. It's fine. It's cool." And he's like, y- y- "You what?" It's like, "Well, surely my brother. Oh, yeah, your brother's dead too. <laughs> it's, like, it's perfect. What's well, kind of the? They're dead. They're they're you, gone. You're fine." And, and, and what's well, the emotions like, of the scene are interesting because what. <laughs> <laughs> Upon learning that his dad is dead, he's kind of like taken aback. He's distressed, but he's kind of okay with it because he knows what his dad is. Well, his dad isn't, was an asshole, right? So. Yeah. So at the same time, he's kind of like, okay, this kind of thing was bound to happen. Yeah, and but it's, it's like, like I can gut, deal with this. It's kind of, it's a gut punch, I'll say, because like he's like, what? And uh, you know, like like it's it's not like he's he's celebrating. He's not like he he starts going, ding dong, the witch is dead. Yeah, you but know? then his brother, and he wasn't close to his brother and his brother kind of represented his father sending him to the wall and doing all this stuff but like he doesn't have any he had no animosity towards his brother his brother wasn't right. cruel to him or anything you know right so so that one hits him that that his brother is dead because that's you know like it, it's not just that because because that's as, as bad as that is it's also that well now his mother and sister are alone you know which isn't addressed but that's 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 a dangerous place to be you know like in this house without anybody to have a name to take care of the house like no there isn't a, a male heir to, to to hold the house and what that means is that other people are going to want that castle so that that puts his whole family at risk too right, it's not right. just that it's his just, so 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 you know he, he's kind of like he, he's kind of like goes from well thank you for this to uh you're a fucking bitch <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say that to her but he's like he, he's very emotional and he and he basically asks to be excused and she's like oh yeah of course yeah she's kind of she's kind of cold through it jory you can see is like kind of pain yeah kind of pain. and this and this highlights a problem with daenerys i think was already there but i think was kind of disguised by the fact that the people she was murdering throughout the whole series were just awful people and so mm-hmm. you can kind of root for her but you get a fact that she she may she may just be uh sociopathic just just a little bit. This touch. Yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's so sure in her methods that she doesn't. She she only looks at like the initial crime and like so. So when that happened, the big thing was that she could have locked them up, but she didn't want to because she thought that would be contradictory to her whole anti-slavery thing. To right. put chains on people would go against that, so she didn't want to do that. So she jumped to the idea of killing them. Tyrion was really pushing for her not to do that to show mercy, right. uh, to well, send well, them to the wall, something which you know Tarly himself kind of shot down. She doesn't consider the consequences of doing that. She doesn't. Yeah, she, 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 do, she doesn't think beyond the surface level, which is that now those people have families, and it's yeah. not just that those families might you know want revenge or something, but in this case, that family is one of your greatest allies, right? You know, like that member of that family that you just told that you murdered his family is the person that saved your right hand man. Yeah, is the person from certain death is the person that that's fought, discovering the ways to kill the White Walkers that you're there to defend against. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and had no reason to hate you beforehand, but now has every reason to hate you. Yes. <laughs> and this leads, you know, Sam is le- walking out. He's very emotional. He encounters Bran, who's just been lurking around this whole episode. No, no. It's like sitting in random places. Now, it bears reminding, because it has been a couple years, that Samwell had already, Samwell, along with Bran, had already discovered the truth about Jon Snow. So Samwell already, already knew. It's not like he's getting new information now. He knows this information information he just he just stumbles out and he sees bran and bran basically tells him yeah it's time to tell Jon snow 
Yeah, and, and he's like, well, why don't you do it? You're his brother, and Bran's like, I'm not his brother, though. Yeah. Oh, well, and, Bran, and he doesn't Bran, trust anybody as much as he trusts you. Yeah, he's Dio. like, why don't you do it? And Bran's just like, bro, I'm I'm, I'm chilling here. Don't make me move. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I'm doing my thing. I, I'm sitting in random places in Winterfell and staring at people in unsettling ways. Yes. <laughs> so he's like, he, he's like, uh, you know, he's like, well, what are you doing out here? And he's like, I'm waiting for an old friend, is what he says. Yes. Um, But the, he says, Send Sam off to to go tell John. Sam goes to the crypts. It's very it's a very Sam entrance because John's having this dramatic moment in front of like Ned Stark's statue in the crypts. Which, by the way, we should point out that in episode two of the entire series, when Ned and John parted ways, uh, John asked about his mother again, and Ned said that the next time they saw each other, he would tell him about his mother. And this whole scene takes place in front of Ned's statue. Yes, so that's important to note as well. The show has a sense of poetry to it about certain things like that so yeah so so john's at ned's statue uh mourning him kind of paying his respects and then he just hears like fumbling and tumbling (laughs) noises which of course means sam's nearby (laughs) sam's nearby tripping over something uh sam walks in and john greets him with a big hug he's like oh why are you here what's going on is is everybody okay is your is is gilly okay is little sam okay and and sam's like did you know? And John's just confused. Like, what do you mean? And he tells him about his father and brother being murdered, or right. being killed by by Daenerys. And basically, John's- basically, Samwell has now come to the conclusion that Daenerys is not fit to be the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms. Daenerys will be an awful choice for ruler. And since Samwell knows the truth, Samwell Samwell tells John that he should be the ruler and gives him a very very good, very compelling reason why. Yeah, so it's like, you know, John talks about how he's not king anymore, that he had given up his his uh, crown. And Sam says, you gave up your crown to save the North. Like, would Daenerys do that? Right. It, it's, that's kind of like a big defense why. But the big reason why is is that John thinks when he's talking about, you know, him being a rightful king, he's like, well, I'm not king in the North anymore. And he's like, I'm not talking about the North. I'm talking about the Seven Kingdoms. And, and this is when he tells him, yeah. He drops the bomb. He says, you are Aegon Targaryen. You are the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. He says R plus plus L equals J is real, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) John's all, but that that shit's on Reddit. I didn't believe it for a second. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. John is like, no, Ned Stark is my father. You know, John's kind of angry about it because he doesn't like it. It it creates it it creates a bad situation for him. Well, John immediately goes, no, Ned Stark is an honorable man. He he wouldn't lie. He wouldn't pretend to be my dad for shits and giggles, and and you know Samuel is like, no, he didn't. He he he, he was an honorable man. He he lied about your parentage because if if Robert Baratheon found out, he would have had you killed. Yeah, and he promised Lyanna that he would he would keep you safe. So he kept his promise to his sister. You know, so he was doing the honorable thing the best he could. Unfortunately, it meant he had to lie. And I guess in some ways, you know, he had to be dishonorable because in, in a way he, he had to lie about Jon Snow. And also the lie also made him look dishonorable for having apparently cheated on his wife during the war, you know? Yeah. So well, it's, it, yeah. That's a big theme of the show is the idea of like honor being an imperfect idea. Like, and Jamie brings it up the best way when he's talking about his oaths and and right. being called the Kingslayer in it's like in season two or something and, and he says he's like I took I sweared so many oaths he's like I, I sweared to you know obey my father I swore to you know uh, protect the people and to serve the king it's all but what if the king tells you to kill the people what if the king tells you to bring your father's head on a platter right. you know like right. like how do, how do you it's impossible to be honorable and in course- that situation because you're you may hold Hold up one of your oaths, but you're breaking another one by holding up that other one. Right, exactly. And we and Jamie is a personification of that because he swore to protect the king, and then when the king turned out to be batshit insane, Jamie found himself murdering the king and breaking that oath. Well, well, keeping others that he would have uh, broke it, if he hadn't. Yes. 
So yeah, it is in part, you can't always do the 100% right thing all the time, every time. You can't just follow like the codes in a book and be like, well, I'm honorable. I just followed this rule right, right. and, you know and what, everything worked out. Reality is often, is often messier than that. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the complications that, that John's now dealing with, with the idea of, you know, if he's starting to hear startling things about the Naros that he's not happy about, right. he's starting to kind of guess those things. So he, 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 may, he might not want to take power from Daenerys. He might, like, he, this is something that he wouldn't want to do. He didn't want to be king in the north, even. Right. So he doesn't want, want a crown. He doesn't want that. But at the same time, but, he has but, to, like... Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting signs that Daenerys might not be all there. She might not be as fit for the role as he is. And if the people need somebody, then he's dishonoring them by not taking up the mantle. Right. Uh, which is what he had done before he had taken up the mantle because it was what was called up, upon him to do. So now he He's in like a bad situation because it's compromising his relationship, which, by the way, now he knows it's like this incestuous relationship as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's so it's complicating his relationship in, in different ways. It's complicating his position. It's complicating his honor and it's complicating his entire sense of identity of who right. he's been. So, his, whole so, life, his entire life story, everything he believes about so, himself. So, so now he has to go through this personal crisis and it's kind of the worst time for Jon Snow to have to go through like a crisis of identity and all this this shit have to process this shit because the, the white walkers are bearing down on them he doesn't have a lot of time to deal with this shit he, yeah. has, to, he has to go and fight well Bran being in the position of knowledge seems to think that, that he needs to know now well yeah that, like it, it would have been ideal if he knew earlier but he needs to know like he, it can't wait right it can't wait and and of course yeah it is a thing that can't wait because because it could be disastrous if he's ignorant too if, if, if they fought the battle with him totally ignorant and say they did make Daenerys queen and she turned out to be unfit. She turned out to be an awful queen. That could be a disaster too. Yes. So, so this is like, this is why John's kind of angry in this situation. Why he's not just emotional, but he's actually kind of angry because it's, this is like, it's, it's destroying a lot of his life right now. Right. Uh, this, this information, this is like, why did you even tell me this? Like, I'd be happy if, happier if you'd never told me any of this. And, uh, so this is the situation he's in, but, uh, that leads us to our next scene which is kind of like if we do have one big you know crazy you know scene in this episode this is it and that's where we see uh Tormund and Beric who are alive did, they did survived mention, the wall uh, did we mention uh Theon rescuing his sister uh oh no we didn't okay yeah we I covered the I... King's Landing stuff but we didn't do that I guess okay, okay yeah so... I thought we skipped that <laughs> <laughs> we'd meant, we'd made reference to it before that. That's why what, what confused me on it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I could say we'll just sum it up very quickly. When Euron was having sex with Cersei, Theon went and rescued his sister with like you know he killed a bunch of the Greyjoys kind of in a stealthy way, and and that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah he it's, 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 <laughs> it's, rescue it's operation. It's really anticlimactic because like literally nothing. We we see him kill like two people, and then he unties her, and then that's that scene. <laughs> it's like okay there were two I big cameos though you could say that I guess uh, one of them was the comedian I forgot who it was from but the other one was uh, Martin Starr who is in uh, Freaks and Geeks and um, uh, Silicon Valley and uh, Spider-Man Homecoming he's like the the teacher of the, the, the debate club guy in Spider-Man Homecoming oh okay yeah he was also in Freaks and Geeks and like I said he was in uh, he's in Silicon Valley he was one of the guys that got he's the, the I think the one that got shot through the eye um, oh. <laughs> and then the, another one was another comedian another comedian a character. I can't remember what he was from. Um, but yeah, those are the two people that got killed. The two great guys. But besides that, yeah, it was, it was just anticlimactic. They, they just, you know, we're like thinking about when, when, it, when the, when the show's coming up and it, it's approaching coming back, it's going through our minds like, oh, you know, like ev everyone's been theorizing, like, how's Theon going to get Yara back? It's going to be a big battle with Euron. Yeah, you know, yeah. I was envisioning like it would end up being like this, like, oh, I thought Captain yeah. America Civil War esque, like, you know, in the scene where like Iron man's fighting both captain and winter soldier at the same time i'm like it's gonna be like that but it's gonna be theon yeah, thought, and yara taking I, down euron and yeah i thought that i thought theon and euron were gonna have to have a confrontation 
going to get Yara back. Nope. <laughs> it's a big nothing scene. It was like, okay, we got to get this out of the way and we got to do it quick. Yeah, and they went and then Yara's basically like, oh, well, well, Euron's banging the queen. I'm going to, you know, retake, uh, uh, retake, retake our, uh, our, our, our castle. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and Theon's like, well, what about Daenerys? And he's like, well, if she has, if she needs to escape somewhere, then she'll need a castle. Yeah. And, so uh, it's like, and, and Yara instructs Theon to go to Winterfell. Cause she can tell that he, he's thinking about it. That, that's right. on his mind. Right. So she's like, just go, go, go to Winterfell and, and help the Stark. So that's what he, he, he goes to do. So Theon's going to do that. Back back to the scene I was talking about, which is the the one kind of yeah, big crazy scene in the episode. This was the crazy moment. This is this this ends the episode, and this this sh- I this is my favorite part of the episode because this this is shit like straight out of a horror movie. It made yeah. me, it made me jump. <laughs> <laughs> Tormund and Beric, they survive the collapse of the wall. They're, they're approaching a castle that looks like it's abandoned because it's, it's just completely dark. There's no fires. There's nothing. And, uh, we know that this is last heart. Yes. This is where the, uh, the Umbers had, had fled. Um, and we, we had seen earlier in the episode, uh, young Ned Umber, uh, named after Ned Stark, um, was, uh, uh, going back to Last Hearth to, to, w- with a bunch of horses and, and carriages to try to get all his people back to Winter. We know this is a White Walker Ground Zero because they were on the wall when the White Walkers broke through it. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Tormund and Barrack were. So we know that they're like right in, around the same vicinity. And, um, at, when, as they're getting into, as, as they're walking into Last Hearth, you can just see the place is just wrecked. It just looks like destroyed. So it's like, okay, oh, yeah. so, yeah, so did they just leave everywhere. quickly or, or what's going on? And as they get into the place, they end up running into Ed and, uh, some brothers of the Night's Watch. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it's a thing where it's like, it, it's funny because like there's all this tension and, and you're expecting White Walkers to like jump out at any second and he turns a corner and it's just like more people. And it's kind of like, ah. Well, it's funny because it was, uh, uh um, <laughs> when Ed sees Torment, he's like, he's like, he's got blue. Blue eyes and Torment's yeah, like, I've always had blue eyes. Yeah, I've always had blue eyes. <laughs> and then they bro hug it out, uh, and they uh they start heading out for to go deeper into Last Hearth and Barrack uh serves his purpose as you know, his sword uh acting as the torch <laughs> to, to light the way for everybody. That's kind of his purpose. He just kinda like leads packs of people with yeah. his on fire. <laughs> so he's leading them through, they go into the great hall of Last Hearth, and you can see that they, there's they see something that's pretty, you know, shocking to them, but we don't see what it is for a while. Eventually, we see what it is. It, it's, the, it's it's young it's Ned me. Umber. <laughs> it's, it's young Ned it. Umber, like pinned to the wall, in like this big artistic presentation of this like spiral using like arms and legs of other people. Oh yeah, like it's gruesome. It's a gruesome sight. It's 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 like something you'd see in Hannibal. Yeah, it's like something <laughs> you'd see in Hannibal, and 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 then and then the boy comes alive, like bright blue eyes, and he starts screaming, and it's this high pitched like. It's- and like, and Beric just like sets him on fire and it sets the whole thing on fire. So we see like the spiral on fire. I don't know what that symbol is supposed to mean, but it's obviously. It's the same symbol that they, they always leave behind. Like okay. even in the first episode, they had like body parts of wildlings like arranged in that pattern. And right. But that, that is definitely like left as a message to them. Yes. This is like a message from the Night King. It's, he left them a piece of art yeah. and it's a Banksy because it was designed to self-destruct when they burn it. <laughs> the Night King is Banksy, confirmed. Night King uh, is Banksy, confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so this, this, that's kind of like the big kind of crazy scene is this this kid as a white just like burning and screeching Yeah, that um, was, as, was... as these men just look on in horror. Yeah. But it's not the last scene of the episode. No. The last not. scene of the episode, we see a cloaked figure riding into Winterfell. It's like, ooh, who's this? And uh, he he gets off his horse. He takes off his cloak. It's Jamie Lannister, and he's looking around. And dope, there's Bran staring right at him. And that's that's how the episode ends. Yeah, that was uh, that's good. I, I can't wait for that confrontation. <laughs> 
I cannot wait for that. I, I, I do wonder though, the actual, because, because he did, he did say he was waiting for an old friend and we assume he was talking about Jamie. Yes. Uh, you know, but it's interesting because the interaction, because, well, Bran isn't Bran by his own admission. He's a three eyed raven. Does a three eyed raven hold grudges for stuff that happened to Bran? Who is, he is no longer Bran. He is a three eyed raven. I don't think so. I think, <laughs> I think it, it's a funny moment for us to see like the Jamie's look of like, oh fuck on his face when he sees Bran. Uh, he's like, oh, I made it to Winterfell. Now I can do something honorable and join the, oh fuck. Yeah. <laughs> There's big, my kid. I pushed out a window. Big, big reminder of the real shitty thing he did. Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I, I think, I don't think Bran's purpose there is to be harmful to Jamie. I think it's going to be quite the contrary. Right. I, th- I, I, I think, think he's going to be the one that kind of fills everybody into how the Kingslayer really got his name. I, I, Bran's yeah. going to be the information dump on that. Cause if you remember yeah. when Bran was getting his visions from the Three Eyed Raven and he had that, they had that big montage of like just tons of different visions he had. Mm-hmm. The one that it kept showing over and over again was the king being killed by the Kingslayer and the king yelling, burn them all and showing the wildfire like that that scene played like over and over again like when it was like cycling through all those visions it did like that like quick montage thing of all those visions and that burned them all with the king and then getting stabbed by the king that was like a big part of that vision dump and so that makes me think that brand's purpose there to see jamie is that brand's actually going to help jamie right he's actually going to end up kind of clearing jamie's name for that i think so and uh yeah that's what I think, at least. Because Bran knows we, don't, we ain't got time for this shit. Yeah, we ain't got time for this shit. We ain't got time for pay shit. <laughs> but that's it. That's Game of Thrones. Uh, Magicians is over until next year uh, or or later, whenever the next season comes. It's Game over. Of Thrones no, is gonna, yeah. <laughs> Game of Thrones is going to be on for the next five weeks as well. So we're going to be talking about that every episode for the next five weeks. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what you have to look forward to on the podcast now is Game of Thrones discussion. But before we if go... You- hate Game of Thrones, you're going to hate this podcast. Yeah, it's, it's all Game of Thrones for the next five weeks. But you might as well just skip it for the next five weeks. Yeah, this is skip until late May. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you hate Game of Thrones. Um, but what's coming up in the week ahead? Uh, so we're recording this on Saturday, but on Friday, R- R- Rakuma and Kaoru coming to Netflix. Oh, that's the new, uh, Watanabe, uh, anime, right? Okay. Yeah. It's, that's the one with the, the girl and the, like, uh, animal of whatever. Can't remember what it is. Oh, no, never mind. That's not what I'm thinking about. Okay. It's an anime. <laughs> it's an anime. I'm thinking about a completely different anime anime. Never mind. <laughs> Cuckoo comes back to Netflix. Uh, Samantha to Netflix. Rami to Hulu. Bosch back to Amazon Prime. I don't know to- what half of this stuff is. <laughs> <laughs> Today, as we're recording this, Murdoch Mysteries uh, comes back to Ovation. Uh, on Monday, April 22nd, Gentleman Jack debuts on HBO. They had a preview for that before Game of Thrones. That's about like a kind of a woman in like this. Uh, it's like a period piece with this strong female character. Oh, yeah. That's- Kind of like not like a lady. She's like you know, kind of acts the role of like a a traditional male role in it. Right, right. She she's a tom girl. Although I don't <laughs> I don't know if like that term is offensive or not now. Um, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and then there's a uh, selection day comes to Netflix that day as well. Then on Tuesday, April twenty third, I think you should leave with Tim Robinson comes to Netflix. On Wednesday, April 24th, another big one comes. Uh, Cobra Kai returns for its second season on that's YouTube good. Premium. That's going to be exciting. So uh, that's when I'm going to be starting up my YouTube Premium subscription again. <laughs> and uh, Bonding comes to Netflix. Then on Thursday, April 25th, Top Gear returns to BBC America. And lastly, on Friday, April 26th, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power are back on Netflix. The Protector comes to Netflix and Yankee comes to Netflix. But who cares about any of that because on Friday, April 26th, it's all about Endgame. Avengers okay. Endgame comes out Endgame. in theaters. I'm going to be there. Yep. I have to find who I'm going with and I'm going to be going to that as well. Nice. So hop a flight, come down to California and go with me. Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> if only it was that so simple. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, as, as I mentioned, next week we're going to be talking about more Game of Thrones. That's going to be for the next five weeks. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Tyson Gifford. You can reach Will. He is at Voxel Hero. You can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, as well as our site, thetotalscreen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast client like iTunes or Pocket Cast. Just look up The Total Screen or The Weekly Set. Just look around and you should be able to find it if you do a few searches. It'll pop up in all of them, pretty much. Uh, 
Uh, and the entire backlog of this podcast is available on our YouTube channel as well. So if you just want to watch it on YouTube, it's all there. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Good night. Good night. If you would like to reach out to us and make a comment, send an email to contact at thetotalscreen.com. Stay tuned to The Total Screen for the very best 